Korean of the Swedish Broadcasting. In the lighter way here, uh, you're now taking the trip of all trips of mankind. Can I ask each one of you, which place would you like to go to for a vacation when you come back to Earth? Well, I, I think that the situation being what it is now, the place I would most like to go immediately is the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. <laughs> if, if, I have, if I'm able to go there, we will have succeeded. I wonder if each of the three could tell us very briefly how your families have reacted to the fact that you're taking this historic mission. Wants to take a crack. Well, I think uh, my particular case, uh, my family has had five years now to uh, become accustomed to uh, this eventuality and over six months to, uh, to face it quite closely. And uh, I think they, they look on this as a tremendous challenge for me. They look up upon it also as a, uh, an invasion somewhat of their privacy and a uh, removing of my presence away from the family for a considerable period of time. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether this is the overriding feature uh, over and above uh, some of the uh, other more pleasant aspects of uh, uh, the particular job that I have as far as uh, it affects my family. Uh, Neil, uh, Marvin Miles, Los Angeles Times. I'd like to know, I understand, I understand that you're going to take manual control of the descent. Can you tell us at what point, how low you will take that control, how far you will burn down, and how low you could stage in the board and go to apps if necessary? Um. We, we have made some significant improvements in, in the flight control system and the computer's interaction with that system in re recent months. Uh, allows us to go into somewhat hybrid methods of manual and automatic. Uh, the predicted method at this point, although we have a great deal of flexibility and choice based on the, on the situation of the time, would be to uh, maintain manual control of attitude and automatic control of throttle uh, through the final descent from an altitude of uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet until such time as the automatic throttling rate of descent was unsatisfactory, at which time we'll go full manual on the throttle, that is, rate of descent command on the throttle, which is operating through the computer. Should that become unsatisfactory, then we can go to a full manual throttle, uh, flying it in a manner like a normal VTOL machine would be flown. So 500 feet is a good. That went down here. Uh, James Burke, BBC. You have mentioned that your flight, like all others, contains very many risks. What? In view of that, will your plans be in the extremely unlikely event that the lunar module does not come up off the lunar surface? Well, it's an unpleasant thing to think about. We've chosen not to think about that up to the present time. We, uh, we don't think that's at all a likely situation. It's certainly a possible one. But uh, at the present time, we're left without recourse at that account. Colonel Aldrin, uh, on Apollo 8, uh, you were the uh, command module pilot in the backup crew. And this one, you're the lunar module pilot. How interchangeable in your preparation for this, or for that matter, in the flying of it, are the uh, roles of the crew? Well, at the uh, stage that we're at right now, I think they're not very interchangeable. <laughs> uh, 
Prior to uh, my assignment as backup uh, command module pilot on Apollo 8, uh, we were together as uh, in slightly different roles, and it was if I'm not mistaken because uh, Mike was dropped out of the uh, mission that uh, we had an adjustment of the crews that, that put me from the lunar module pilot into the command module pilot's position. Uh, for Apollo 8, uh, there was no lunar module, so this was not much of an adjustment. Uh, it was just moving from uh, an emphasis on systems to more in, in navigation. Now, since I had previous training uh, to some degree in the lunar module, why then moving back into that position was was not too difficult a task. That one on the far side. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, er earlier there was some concern expressed that uh, you were rushed to get in all your training necessary for this flight. What is the, uh, uh, the state of your training readiness now? The, uh, the reason that that was a concern is that the, the final training for a crew is the last thing that takes place. In other words, the procedures must be developed and the simulations completely set up and the simulators ready to fly and the checklists made and so on before the final training can take place. And these, of course, were the pacing items, these intermediate things to the final training. At this point in time, uh, we have a high confidence level that the procedures and uh, checklists, simulations that we are now operating are correct and will fly the mission the way they are now detailed. So, uh, of, of course, there was a good deal of concern in our own minds and, and many other people in, in the organization that all these things for the descent, ascent, surface work would fall into place in time. We do uh, feel at this point that we've been very fortunate in, in, in having those things uh, make the schedule along with the with the hardware, which of course is on the pad now and ready to fly. Shelton, you were speaking. Of, you were speaking a few minutes ago about naming the spacecraft Columbia and so on. Do you have any plans to name the site where you land? That is to say, the immediate area where you land. Will you give it any name or or not? Um, as on previous flights, we, uh, in the absence of official names for various locations and landmarks on the lunar surface, have, have chosen to use some, some unofficial names for our recognition purposes and for our training purposes. We'll continue to do that. One more over here. Mr. Armstrong, there's been some discussion of the possibility that with the uh, almost 10 hours interposed between the time of the landing and the scheduled uh, 